Did you know that one of the best ways to study the water on the Earth is to go into space? Our own Nick Schmitz talks to two scientists using NASA satellites to measure the amount of fresh water on the Earth's surface. A fundamental science question that I would like to answer, along with other scientists and other members of the team, is how much fresh water is there in the Earth? And more importantly, where is it and at what point in time? Bart, can you tell me a little bit about what you're studying and how you're studying it? I use satellite measurements from space to study fresh water on the Earth's surface. For example, during the winter you'll have a snow-covered mountain, and then all of that water will run off in the spring and go elsewhere. We want to be able to follow that water and perhaps predict in the near term how much water there will be in different parts of the world, and when that water will run off, and when we could use that water once it has run off. And why is it important to know this? Well, water is a substance that we all need. We learn in the hydrologic cycle from school that water naturally cycles through. It goes up, it goes down, which is true, but it does not necessarily come out in the places we live or in a condition that is safe to drink. So if we're going to better manage and protect this resource, a fundamental question is how much of this stuff is there? And by using satellites and sensors and math and computer models, we can do just that. Uh, Bart, I know that you are a professor at the University of Maryland, where we are right now, but I also know that you do some work with NASA. Yeah, so NASA is a wonderful organization to work with, and they collect the satellite data, which I need to do my research. One scientist in particular I work with quite a bit is Dr. Sujay Kumar of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm um, Sujay Kumar, and I'm a scientist in the Hydrological Sciences Lab at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. We study water because we all need water for our sustenance. So understanding how the water cycle is changing, how that impacts how much water we have uh, is obviously a huge, hugely relevant question. So we use NASA's uh, remote sensing capabilities and modeling tools to look at this problem. I always assumed that NASA was studying the stars and other planets. NASA does, as we all know, uh, incredible work on studying the sun, uh, other planets, our solar system, but a big part of what NASA does is also studying our own planet, right? So we have a fairly large fleet of satellites uh, that measure all kinds of things about our water cycle, in, in, which is what I'm studying. How the water cycle, how is it changing, uh, particularly you know, in the era of climate change, how are humans influencing it, how are we changing it, and, and the complexity of how the land itself is evolving. We look at water cycle changes around the world. Agriculture is one of the big human activities. It needs a lot of water. Where does that water come from? We take it out of rivers or we pump it out of the aquifers. We kind of think of groundwater as a long-term bank account in some ways, right? So you only take it out when you really, really need it. It takes years, hundreds of years sometimes to replenish the aquifer, right? So that's why we have to be more careful about using our long-term bank account or the groundwater resources. Um, because once it's gone, it's gone. It takes hundreds of years to build it back up. So it's hundreds of years to fill it up, but it doesn't take hundreds of years to deplete it? You know, so let's say you have two droughts back to back. When there is a drought happening, we would normally just pump it out, and that's what happened in California in, in the 2012 drought. But now we can you know, assess that that sort of long-term bank account or reserve has depleted uh, significantly. So in the high plains, you look at the Ogallala Aquifer, that's, that's where uh, we take about 30% of the water for uh, agriculture comes from the Ogallala. And that has gone down significantly. And how do we know this? Because we have satellites that can uh, tell you how the, those sort of things that we can't directly observe with eyes, right, uh, they're changing. And this has been observed in not just in the U.S., but in other parts of the world. So in northern India, there has been huge depletion of groundwater resources. 
Bart, what methodologies are you using to, to gather this data? There are three different types of sensors that we use. We might use a radiometer, which measures the emission of energy from an object of interest, maybe a lake or maybe a snow-covered mountain. Or we can use radar, where we send radiation down and we measure its backscatter. And if we know something about the physics of the target that that photon bounced off of, then we can infer its behavior from the reflection of that radiation back to the sensor. So we have radiometry, which is passive, radar, which is active, and now a third active system, LIDAR, very similar to radar, but just a slightly different wavelength. Radar be, be microwave, LIDAR is typically visible light. And when we study snow, for example, we might use green light because it bounces off of snow in a very good way. Those are three types of sensors we can use to see water. In the last two decades, we've been using a system called GRACE, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, which has two sensors, one chasing the other. NASA affectionately refers to them as Tom chasing Jerry. And they measure the distance between those two satellites very accurately. And if you know something about the mechanics of those satellites, feeling the gravity under those satellites, we can use that information rather to see water, but to feel water deep in the ground. When we study about water, we uh, take a step back and think about Earth as a whole. Water is everywhere, and the changes that are happening on the Earth system impacts all these components. So I study uh, what's happening to the water on the land surface, because that's where people live. And that's also where we have changed the landscape quite significantly, right? We have built houses, we have built roads, we have built dams, we have done agriculture, basically significantly changed the landscape, not to mention climate change. So there's a lot of factors at play into um, studying water. 20 or 30 years ago, we might have measured water the same way, but the instruments are more sophisticated, more sensitive, they're smaller, which makes them cheaper, which means we can put more of them into space simultaneously. Another nice advance has been the computing power. Organizations like NASA require large supercomputers, and the computers have become more sophisticated, more advanced, faster, and bigger. And then we've also seen the introduction of the cloud which the cloud has really enabled data sharing, of which NASA has been a global leader in this field. So the methodologies are similar, you're just getting more accurate readings? That's exactly right. The physics does not change. The mathematics does not change. It just gets bigger and more complicated. Does our understanding of this data, has that changed? Absolutely. We are seeing deeper into our understanding than before. And because we have more of these coordinated sensors flying simultaneously, we have more independent measurements at a simultaneous collection point in space and time, which means we can pile on independent pieces of information and truly get a deeper, richer understanding of the processes that we're, that we're studying, rather than more surficial understanding, perhaps, from 20 or 30 years ago compared to today. How much fresh water is there on the planet? That's an excellent question, and that's the question I'm trying to answer. What I can say right now is that when it comes to fresh water, it's only about 3% of all of the water on the planet. Most of it has salt, and we cannot drink that water. And if we want to remove that salt, it's not easy, it's very expensive. So we want to just focus on the fresh water. Now, of that fresh water, approximately 70% of the global freshwater is locked up in the form of ice sheets, ice caps, and glaciers, areas of the globe that we can't get at. The remainder of that freshwater, most of it is in the ground, out of sight, out of mind. We use a lot of that water without realizing how much water we're using. And in many parts of the world, we're using it at an unsustainable rate. I grew up in Kansas, for example home to the Ogallala Aquifer. They are currently pulling water out of the Ogallala that has been dated to be more than 100,000 years old. 
It takes a long time to recharge these aquifers. It can be hundreds of years, depending on the size and depth of these aquifers. That is why we need to understand how much we have so that, again, we can preserve and protect that resource. If only 3% of the water on the planet is fresh water and the other 97% is salt water, why can't we just take the salt out? So desalinization has been talked about as an alternate solution, but you know, so we have to remember that this is a very expensive process. So it's not really feasible at a very large scale. And the other factor is that it, it's not a carbon neutral process. So it, it has a, a subsequent impact um, on the, the larger climate. So particularly if you're going to try to do this at a very large scale. With this data that you're collecting and the understanding that you have about the fresh water on the globe, what, what can we learn from this? What, how can we use this information? Well. A fundamental question we would like to answer is how much water in the world is there and where is it? And that is still an unanswered question. We are getting closer and closer and closer. The accuracy is getting closer and the uncertainty is getting more and more narrow. Uh, how can we use this information? It's a finite resource with increasing demands. We need to preserve and protect this. And if we're ever going to preserve and protect it, a fundamental question we need to know is how much is there? And so these types of questions that we are trying to answer could eventually be used by governmental organizations or other groups that help protect the public and provide clean water. And we can serve as advisors to these organizations. Here's how much water you have at the current rate. Perhaps you will run out by this date. We need to change some practices so that in the future you will have the water you need. It's just like Thomas Fuller said, we never know the value of water until the well runs dry. We only miss it when we no longer have it. And this is a critical resource. We need to protect this resource so that we have hope for the future. Bart, so what can we do to make this better? It's a great question. There's a lot that we can do. As we know with recycling, we often hear the phrase, think globally, act locally. We can do the same with water. We need to recognize that it is finite. Even though it falls out of the sky, it's not unlimited. We should be cognizant of how much water we use and try to reduce it where we can. Case in point, I used to brush my teeth and I would leave the tap on. And I realized I was just wasting water. Why don't I brush my teeth and turn the water off while I brush my teeth? Recycling saves water. We do not think about how much water is required to make the everyday products we use. We should think globally and act locally and all the small changes that we can make every bit helps.